In 1921, Ottawa, uh, concerned about the Royal Bank's negotiations with Costa Rica, sent the Patriot, the Patrician, and the Aurora Canadian naval vessels off the coast of Costa Rica to help the Royal Bank satisfactorily renegotiate its debt um, with the Costa Rican government. So all the way back in 1921, you have an example of Canadian gunboat diplomacy using our gunboats, our military gunboats, to exert political pressure on a country, particularly in, in, in the Caribbean and Central America historically, uh, to exert political pressure on a country at the behest of Canadian um, uh, corporate interests. In 1932, the Vancouver, Vancouver Sun, the January Vancouver Sun headline read, El Salvador Alive with Red Revolt. The sub-headline explained, Canadian destroyers from Colombia, sorry, Canadian destroyers from British Columbia to the rescue. There was a peasant indigenous uprising in El Salvador, um, and the Hernandez Martinez government uh, was sort of waffling about sending out the troops uh, to, to squash this rebellion, they weren't sure about the troops' loyalty. Uh, London, which had significant, uh, 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 Great Britain, England, had significant economic interests in El Salvador, alongside some Canadian economic interests, uh, was worried about this, this uh, uprising, this, this socialistic, this peasant uprising, uh, and asked Ottawa, which had two naval vessels in the region, uh, to send the Canadian gunboats off the coast of El Salvador. Um, that's what happened. According to the account of the Canadian commander, a man by the name of Brodeur, it was the presence of the Canadian uh, naval vessels that provided the Martinez government in El Salvador, in El Salvador with the backbone uh, to send out the troops uh, to quash the rebellion. In El Salvador, in history, it's called La Matanza. As many as 30,000 people were killed over the preceding months, including uh, Farabundo Martí, who is the namesake of the FMLN uh, political party that actually just won office in El Salvador um, about six or eight months ago. So back in 1932, you have an example of Canadian uh, gunboat diplomacy at the behest of British uh, imperial uh, interests. I guess I'm loud. Uh, the anti-war movement in this country had a, had a victory, a clear victory. Um, the hundred plus thousands in the street of Montreal, I'm sure thousands here in London, uh, across the country, uh, uh, mobilized to tell the Croatian government that we didn't want Canada to officially, or in, well, in any way, support the U.S. war in Vietnam. What we won was a partial victory. We won the Croatian government uh, not officially endorsing but the Bush administration's coalition of willing. We didn't win a full victory. Behind our backs, while publicly telling us they weren't supporting the war in, in Iraq, privately, Canadian politicians worked to support uh, the U.S. invasion and occupation uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, first of all, uh, providing Americans with the ability to fly over Canadian airspace, and refuel in, in uh, Newfoundland. Uh, thousands of US troops en route to Iraq flew over Canadian airspace, refueled in Newfoundland. Uh, some countries that were officially part of the Coalition of Willing got their status in the Coalition of Willing simply for providing the ability of Americans to fly over uh, their airspace. But that was just the sort of the tip of Canadian support uh, for the US invasion. Canada was in charge of Task Force 151 which was a NATO naval brigade patrolling in the Arabian Sea uh, off the coast of Iraq in the lead up to the US war. And the Liberal government actually had legal opinion that suggested that Canada's role in charge of Task Force 151 made Canada legally at war with Iraq. Um, the Canadian troops that actually participated in the invasion, at least 30 Canadian troops participated in the invasion in British and US units. Other countries that were not part of the coalition were willing withdrew their troops uh, from, the, from, from U.S. and British exchange programs. Canada did not, did not do that. Uh, the Canadian military planners that helped plan the invasion, initially from uh, uh, Tampa, Florida, and when the Americans moved their main planning base from Tampa uh, to Qatar, at least 25 Canadian military planners 
made that move to Qatar to help plan the U.S. invasion uh, from Qatar. General Robert Isaac, the current head of the Canadian military, uh, was deputy forces commander in Baghdad uh, for about six months to a year, uh, in charge of 35,000 foreign troops in Iraq. Uh, and once the, the American, uh, Americans began to consolidate, or uh, just back up a second, Joint Task Force 2, Canadian Special Forces Commandos um, that were involved in Iraq became, became public that they were Special Forces commanders, uh, Commandos from Canada uh, fighting in Iraq. And once the Americans began to try to consolidate their occupation, uh, actually about like five weeks after the American invasion, Canada announced $300 million in aid uh, to Iraq. Uh, and that's really a principle of Canadian aid. We hear about Canadian aid, we think of what, they, what the, our politicians tell us is it's about helping the, 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 the poor children, show us pictures of poor children waving Canadian flags, uh, getting, a, getting a vaccination or whatnot. But in fact, a, a principle of Canadian aid is that where the U.S. kills, Canada provides aid. And that goes back all the way to the Korean War of 1950-1953. Canada provided significant aid to South, uh, South Korea. Uh, likewise, during the U.S. War in Vietnam, uh, provided significant aid uh, to South Vietnam, uh, uh, and over the past few years, the main recipients of Canadian aid, of course, as we all know, number one recipient is Afghanistan, number two recipient is Haiti, and number three recipient, at least in, the, in between 2004 and 2006, was Iraq. What does Afghanistan, Haiti, and Iraq uh, have to do with each other? Well, uh, it's not that they're in similar situations of poverty, it's that in all three cases, there are U.S. troops um, and Canadian troops that have either invaded, occupied, or continue to invade, or continue to occupy um, those countries. Um, so Canada provided the support by Canadian aid um, to the U.S. Uh, attempts to consolidate uh, the occupation um, in Iraq. So part, part of this mythology about Canada's role in the world uh, comes from the fact that Outside of what is current day Canada, if you don't take the term First Nation seriously, which we should of course, but if you don't take that term seriously, Canada has never been a colonial power. Uh, Ottawa has never had colonies abroad like most European countries, Japan, um, certainly Western European countries, uh, uh, and, and the US in a slightly different form. Canada has never had formal colonies uh, outside of what is current day, uh, its current day borders. That wasn't for a lack of trying by the Canadian elite. In the late 1800s, Canadian banking and insurance interests, which were very significant um, in, in the English Caribbean, pushed for Ottawa to formally annex the British Caribbean colonies. Um, and even into um, after the First World War, um, when other countries that fought, other dominions of the British Empire, that fought on behalf of Great Britain in World War I, um, South Africa, uh, um, uh, Australia, they, they received compensation by getting the German colonies that were nearby. Canada, without any German colonies near Canada, Ottawa formally asked London if Canada could take over the British Car Caribbean as compensation for our country's participation um, in, the, uh, in the First World War. So, right here, on to the right, we have uh, our good friend uh, Pierre Trudeau, uh, Prime Minister, uh, considered a great internationalist. Next to him, um, we have uh, that great man and his great friend, uh, Augusto uh, Pinochet. In 1973, uh, for people who probably don't have the historical background, uh, the U.S., as is widely accepted, helped overthrow uh, uh, Chile's elected president, um, Salvador Allende, um, and put dictator Augusto Pinochet in power, who, who led for about 17 years um, and killed thousands of people. This quote here, the rest of this is from the Canadian ambassador in Santiago, Chile, uh, to Ottawa. The rest of this quote reads, the country has been on a prolonged political binge under the elected Allende government and the junta has assumed the probably thankless task of sobering Chile up. 